to the uh, uh, Many Hats Club uh, Isolation Con. I'm really delighted uh, to introduce Tanya Yanka, uh, aka She Hacks Purple. I almost got it right. Come on, I almost got it. Uh, she Hacks Purple. Uh, who is a friend of the Many Hats Club. You've been on our podcast and, uh, and and actually will be again when we finally arrange that to happen. So, but we've got the keynote here. So I'm really, and by, I'm, I'm really appreciative of doing this as well. So appreciate it. You're so, so awesome. So um, the, the floor is absolutely yours um, with your talk. Purple is new back. I'm going to mute myself and let you take over. So thank you very much, Tanya. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stu. Hi everyone, I am Tanya Jenka and I'm going to talk to you about securing modern apps. So there's lots of old stuff and there's lots of old types of apps and we're not going to talk about any of that. We're only going to talk about cool new things and how to secure that. So I'm not going to cover, you know, a regular web app and all of the old school things. I'm not going to talk about memory safety or any of that. I'm going to talk about APIs, microservices, cloud, things like that. People are changing, the way their apps are changing, our tech stacks are changing, and we as security people need to change, and that's what this talk is about. So with that, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about red team, which is offensive security. We're going to talk about blue team, which is defensive security. We're going to talk about purple team, which I like to call collaborative security. <laughs> I'm going to rant about hackers <laughs> and how lots of people see us like this. I don't see us like this. This is not what I see when I see other security professionals. This is what I see. Yes, us helping each other, us protecting people. For me, what we do is very noble. Um, I believe what the work that we do is good, like Superman does good. And so this is the way I see things, and you're going to see a huge slant of that throughout this talk and basically every talk I ever give. Um, but with that, let's do the mandatory about me slide. So this is the slide that every speaker gives because we want you to know we're qualified to give our own talk. So as I said previously, I'm Tanya Jenka. I like punk rock on the internet. I'm known as She Hacks Purple. We'll talk about Purple Team today. That's what this talk's about. Um, I am one of the founders of WOSEC, Women of Security. Um, I love OWASP, I'm this huge fan, I have a project, I have a chapter, I'm totally obsessed with that community. Um, and I'm a security trainer and coach at my own startup called SheXPurple.dev. And lastly, I'm Canadian. <laughs> I thought I would add that in there for fun. Anyway, thanks for coming to my talk. I know there's two other amazing talks on the other tracks right now, but let's learn some app stack. Okay, so, this is the plan. So I like to like tell everyone what I'm going to tell them. And then throughout the talk, I tell them the things I'm going to tell them. And then after I'll tell you what I told you. So I like to summarize and make sure that you can take away as much as possible from this 55 minutes. So modern approaches to AppSec. So the first one is, oh my gosh, it turns out we need soft skills if we want to be good at security. Oh no. Then the next one is we're going to talk about security tactics for modern apps. So strategies and tactics, tooling, um, all sorts of different ways that we can do things. Briefly, we're going to talk about automating boring stuff because you as a security person should, you as a tech person, a person that writes code, a person that works in IT, you should never do something manually more than two or three times when you could automate it. Um, and then we're going to talk about continuous learning. So you coming to Isolation Con or you joining the many hat clubs, which I totally think you should do, that's part of your continuous learning. And we're going to talk about more different ways that we can continue to learn and perfect and hone our skills. Um, because when you stop learning, um, you're not going to be awesome at your job anymore. And you chose tech because you wanted a challenge. So we're going to talk about how you can make sure you keep meeting those challenges. But let's get purple and start our talk. OK, so first of all, I'm going to give you a few definitions. If you already know this, please forgive me. It's just I don't know the level of knowledge of every single person that's joining us. And I'd rather spend two or three minutes invested at the beginning to make sure everyone can come along for the entire talk. So first, what is application security? And why did she call it AppSec? Because there's too many syllables, that's why. <laughs> um, so what is application security? It is any and every activity that you do to make sure your software is secure. It could be formal things. It could be 
Oh, someone's putting something in the chat. That's really distracting. <laughs> it's, it, it could be you hiring someone to do a secure code review or you doing it yourself. It could be you grepping through source code and looking for something that you know was a problem in one app and then checking the rest of the apps to see if it's there. It could be you updating your framework because you know there's a big vulnerability out. Any of the things that you do to make sure your software is secure as part of AppSec. And who said that? Me! <laughs> oh, I know we shouldn't quote ourselves, but I don't care. <laughs> so what is DevSecOps then, right? Basically, it's AppSec in a DevOps environment. So if you're doing DevOps, you should be doing your job securely. If you're doing um, software development, you should be doing your job as securely as you know how to do it, right? But DevSecOps is us AppSec people adjusting ourselves so that we can weave our activities or our goals through your DevOps environment, your processes, all the things that you're doing and still complement you instead of stopping and breaking all your stuff but with the same goals that we always have to make sure you reliably release high quality, very secure software. And my friend Imran said that he's totally awesome. Okay, so now I'm gonna have more definitions. So what is red team? So you've probably heard of red team a lot more than you've heard of blue or purple team. So let's start with that. Uh, so red team are attackers, they're offensive security and I don't mean they point and swear. Um, so it's adversarial style testing, often done against prod. They find real risks. Um, so penetration testing, writing exploits, doing a red team exercise where you attack production systems and then see where they fare. Um, for instance, chaos engineering, all of this would be part of red team. It would be under that side of things. So now there's blue team. Blue team are defenders. They are our protectors. They're the ones that are ensuring that we have defenses and that they're set up correctly and that they're the right defenses. They're monitoring, logging, alerting, patching, responding, doing all the things to try to shield us. And then now purple. So I consider purple team collaboration, empathy, and advocacy. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by those. I realize that this is a woman giving this talk, so you're probably like, oh God, she's gonna talk about hugs and care bears. And I might, but that's not what most of this talk is about, just to be clear. Okay, so what is purple team? So some people say it's red team plus blue team. And I, I do agree that it's the, got mixtures of both. I believe that we are collaborators. Um, we're cooperators and we are communicators. So we are that bridge in between the security team and the dev and ops team. We are that team that makes sure that they can still get their jobs done, but we weave our security through everything they're doing and support them and make sure they get there. So we are teaching, providing tools. We do everything we can to make sure they get to the finish line with a secure app. Um, I believe that we have to advocate for both developers and security and walk that line of being interested and supporting of both. I believe purple team is AppSec as a whole. It's a giant umbrella and blue team and red team are underneath it. All of the activities of AppSec add up to purple. So what do purple team members do? Um, so they hold consultations with developers. So rather than saying, this is the new standard and you must follow it, they meet with everyone and talk with them and ask if it's actually possible. Uh, they, provide guidance, assistance, resources, writings, um, like written materials, anything that they can to make sure that developers have the things they need. They give them actual tools, and by that I mean like security tools or making sure that they're allowed um, more plugins in their browsers that they need so they can do their testing and ensuring that those tools that they have are secure. Like not just that they're security tools, but that the, those tools aren't gonna cause problems for the rest of your network. Sometimes they create tools, sometimes they write their own. They create documentation that's actually readable and understandable and written in developer words instead of in security team's words. So an AppSec person wouldn't write, session IDs are ephemeral. That is useless. <laughs> that is useless information. A software developer needs to know a session ID needs to be at least 64 characters, preferably 128. It needs to be unique, created with a high quality 
random number generator. It needs to be destroyed every time you log out or after X amount of activity, etc. It needs to be extremely explicit and then they will run off and build you a kick-ass piece of software that does that. But if you say it's ephemeral, that means it's short-lived. Like, what does that mean? So we need accessible information written in their words, not our words. Um, and we need to advocate for both sides. So sometimes developers have a really tight deadline, but also we can't release things that are wildly insecure. And sometimes we have to meet in the middle and it's our job to make sure we aren't completely biased only one way or only the other, which can be hard sometimes. Yes, I'm just gonna repeat that. This is why we have to have empathy. Um, you can be an AppSec professional if you've never written a line of code in your life but you cannot be an AppSec professional if you don't give a crap about the developers and what they're trying to get done and their deadlines and their job requirements. So we have to advocate for both sides, not just one. And it is my belief that Purple Team is a modern approach to application security. We used to have two silos, security over here, yelling at the devs, saying no a lot, devs over here, hiding under tables, avoiding the security team. That was me when I was a dev, I was like, no. Okay, so what do I mean by advocacy, right? What do I mean by that? So the, the, te the technical definition of advocacy is public support or like recommend recommendations towards a cause or a policy. So in our case, we are going to support like with tools, with time, with advice, with, uh, you know, like our technical activities, we're going to support the cause of making sure we have secure software and making sure our devs can do their job securely and the policies of our workplace, the security policies. And definitely we need some security policies in regard to software so that the devs know what we want from them. That is another thing. So advocacy is showing support and recommendation for. So all of our recommendations are in line with the things that we support. Okay, so here are some principles for success in your advocacy. Okay, so the first one is self-service. Whenever possible, make anything you have self-service for devs. They don't want to wait on you. Don't be a bottleneck. Anything that you can make, like whether it be automated or just whatever you can do so that they can serve themselves will save you time and make them feel independent. Um, we need to make sure they can trust us. So whatever you can do to build trust, and this definitely means holding their confidentiality. So sometimes people will report things to you and it'll be their teammates or their friends or all these other people. It's really, really important. They know that they can trust you with that information and you're not gonna make them regret it. Um, it's important we remember they are human beings. I know I have to say that, right? <laughs> um, but when you design things, try to remember that, that they're not machines, they're humans. Sometimes we can forget. Um, so we want to empower them. And by that, I mean give them tools, give them processes that actually work, and then give them the knowledge that they need to do their job. And that also means don't give them a crap ton of extra knowledge they do not need to do their job. So don't flood them. So for instance, don't send them a link to NIST and tell them to read it unless they have sleeping problems. Um, equal opportunity. So I'm a firm believer that security should be available for everyone in your org and not just you know, the senior people. I worked at this one place where the senior devs told me that all of the devs underneath them were too stupid to learn security. And then I realized I was definitely talking to the wrong people. And also I feel pity for someone that has to work for someone that thinks that way about them. That is tragedy, but anyway, we need accountability. So this means if your team makes a mistake, it's really important that you admit it and you tell the devs about it if appropriate. I mean, if it's an incident, it has nothing to do with them, you should not tell them. But whenever possible, try to hold your own team accountable. Like if you're, providing, like if you're creating a huge bottleneck on a project, acknowledge it. Talk about ways that you can fix it. And maybe that means you need to hire someone. It could be a lot of different things, but um, I know personally that I have a bit of perfectionism issues sometimes. It's really hard for me to admit mistakes, but I can tell you that when you do, when you admit you're vulnerable, when you admit there's a problem or an error, that that is when you've built the absolute most amount of trust with another person and that is when they know 
that they can like that you're allowing them to hold you accountable you've told them what the problem is and like together you make a plan to fix it and then you go execute that plan if something happens in the future and that person steps out of line you can definitely exert the same requirement of them and lastly it's important to make your stuff accessible um, a lot of us don't realize how many people where we work are not fully abled so this could just mean um, you know, if, if someone needs to work from home when they do their training or providing uh, audiobooks if they're available versus just written books or just ebooks, right? So ask people what they need. Make this, this little thing will mean the world to some of your employees. Not going to go on and on about it, but accessibility is a real thing and that doesn't just mean your customers. All right, empathy. It turns out that soft skills are life skills. They're life skills. And just some people didn't bother developing them because for some reason they thought that was okay. You will be an awful application security professional if you have no empathy. I, okay, so I'm trying to stay on track for my exactly 55 minutes, but I'll just tell one story. I worked somewhere once and in the first couple weeks, I saw two of my team members who were, who'd been there a lot longer than me, who I'd already, like my spidey senses were just like, no, about both of them. But when I saw this, I just, I, I melted down. Um, so they were both making faces at each other and they're both like, meh, and then laughing at each other. And I, I'm watching them and it looks like, you know, like four year olds on a playground, like what are they doing? And they're making these weird faces at each other. And I come up and I'm like, brand new employee, I'm trying really hard to be friendly. And I'm like, hey guys, what are you doing? And they told me with no shame at all, they're proud of themselves. We're practicing faces to make at software developers in meetings when they ask stupid questions. So they know how stupid they are and they know not to ask again. And they just had a meeting with a bunch of devs and whenever the devs had asked them something, which I'm sure they just didn't know the answer to, they had made a condescending face like that at them and then refused to answer their question. And so I told my boss and my boss was like, well, you know, boys will be boys and both, like all these excuses for them. And I told her, I, couldn't go to a meeting with them and submit a dev to that. And that I was totally disgusted and repulsed. And I was just like, I can't work with them. <laughs> um, yeah, so I didn't last there very long. But anyway, stories. Okay, continue to talk, Tanya. Okay, idols. Um, so I believe that we have an obsession with hackers. I believe that like, we seem to think that red team is more important than the other teams and that we appear to be glorifying it. And sometimes people tell me that that's not true, but do we have this many different movies about accountants? No, we don't. Do we have TV shows dedicated to like, oh my gosh, I just gotta get this tax report now. No, but we have a complete obsession with Red Team. And I truly believe that it's harming our industry. When I see like Mr. Robot, like, yes, that's like, a fun piece of television entertainment. I liked watching it. I watched some of it, but I liked what I watched, most of it. Um, but, but I don't want anyone to think I'm like that guy. <laughs> I don't want people to think that that's what I do for a living. And if that had been my introduction to security, I'm not sure I would have joined our field, right? Like, um, I feel that that is like repelling away lots of people who maybe are like me, who are a little bit more like, the OWASP care bear of security that wants to come and help the devs, right? And all parts, all the jobs in security are important, not just red team. I'm also seeing where companies just like pen test the crap out of their apps and they don't do anything else for security. And I'm just like, what are you thinking? Like, but they don't know. They don't know that, that pen testing is one part under the entire AppSec umbrella and there's so many different activities you can do. And this is because we've glorified pen testing. Pen testing is super important, but it is not the only thing that is important. And this, it just like frustrates the pants off of me, even though I was a pen tester. And I started as a pen tester because it's, it's the only job that I thought I had. 
So like, I am really worried about this. As, a, as an, oh, so this should say Cyber Mentoring Monday. So pretend it says Cyber Mentoring Monday because we've changed our hashtag. So every Monday I do this thing and a bunch of us participate now and we use this hashtag Cyber Mentoring Monday to help people find professional mentors and get advice on how to enter our field. Well, when I first started it, people, the first six months, just every single week, it was just, I wanna be a pen tester, I wanna be a pen tester, I wanna be a pen tester. But slowly after sharing just tons of stuff about OPSEC, instant response, forensics, like all the different types of jobs. And I also, you know, I wrote some articles and stuff too to show people like there's this entire umbrella under InfoSec and another smaller umbrella under AppSec of so many cool jobs. And now people are asking for all sorts of things. And I think that's really, really wonderful to see this shift. But if people only want one job, that's problematic too. Okay, so now I'm gonna get kind of technical on you and I'm assuming that you're gonna love it because I do. Um, <laughs> um, so this is an image that um, someone I used to work with, Ashley Namara, made for me. And I used to joke that when I didn't know what to do, I would tweet at OWASP and shine the bat symbol into the into the internet and then the OWASP community would come and help me with my AppSec problems. <laughs> and so she made this beautiful illustration. She's a very talented artist and she's open sourced this image. So if any of you want to print your own stickers, you can. But let's talk about what the purple team does. So we're going to talk about specific strategies for modern apps now. And this is going to be like 98% of the rest of the talk. So please be ready. And all these slides are available after, and they're recording it. So don't freak out if you're like, my brain melted after the first five minutes. It's OK. Mine did too. <laughs> OK, so let's start with zero trust. What we used to do back in the day is we would have the perimeter protected. So we had an amazing wall, a firewall. And everything inside we trusted and everything outside was bad. And we would just work really hard on protecting the perimeter. Well, what happened is, is if we had insider threats, they had access to everything and that was a disaster. If someone managed to get in past the firewall and they were malicious, they had access to everything, disaster. Also, just if there's an accident, again, everything's open, potential disaster. And so a, a bunch of different people came up with the idea of zero trust. And then I believe Google popularized it. Um, and it's brilliant. The idea is, is that you only open, so by default, you trust no one. And then you only open up to the thing that needs it. So for instance, close every single port except for the one that you need. And if you can, close that 98% of the time and just open it when you use it, right? Or if you have a database and it needs to talk to an app, then only the service account for that app can talk to it. And nothing else can ever talk to it except the administrator. And again, only the administrator has access, not everyone on the team. So zero trust in our applications, between our applications, between our app and our API and our APIs to other APIs, between serverless, all of those things, zero trust. Authenticate and authorize every single time. Um, the way you configure things, the way you design your network, everything should be zero trust. And hand in hand with that, similar but not the same is assume breach. So this is when you react to things and when you design things, assume a breach has happened, and then look at your design again. If a thing happens, let's say, um, let's say you have a coordinated or responsible disclosure program, or you have a, a bounty, a bug bounty program. Someone reports a bug, it's big and scary. You should assume breach and involve your incident response team. Tell them, we want you to investigate and see if something happened. This would be assuming breach. But the key here is just, we can't trust anymore. Trusting really burned us many, many times. And so zero trust and only trusting the things you absolutely need to is, is malicious actors where it's night. It's the best. Okay, so serverless and logic apps. So a logic app is a trigger. It's true or it's false. And by that I mean, um, like let's say uh, a user tries to log in in uh, 100 times in under a minute. 
and that sets off a trigger. That would be a logic app. It would be a setting. And then when the logic app runs, the only thing it does usually is call a serverless app. And a serverless app, let's, let's step back a bit. So remember back in the day, we used to have big, huge servers, bare metal, we called it. We put it in big racks. We gave it cute names. We, you would have one app on one server or like 20 apps on one server. And then they'd all be in each other's space and problematic, et cetera. So then we created virtual machines and we broke that up. So you could run several different machines in a hypervisor all on the same physical server. Then we went to the cloud where server space kind of moved all around, right? And it became a bit more, um, it was managed for us and we couldn't see what's going on in the background, but we could have VMs everywhere. Then from virtual machines, we went into containers and container is just a subset of the operating system that you need to run your app or your API or your microservice or whatever it is that you're doing. So previously, let's say a virtual machine might have two gigs of memory to run Windows Server and then another two gigs of hard drive space to save all that stuff from the operating system. You could have a microservice run on a little container and it could have three megs of RAM and four megs of hard drive space. And serverless app, or sorry, um, and so uh, a serverless app is a container that, that just runs when you need it. So um, it doesn't sit there running all the time like a regular container would or a virtual machine or a server. It just turns on, the container explodes, it runs whatever it's supposed to do, and then it self-destructs and releases all of the resources. So that means you could pay maybe for nine minutes a month instead of every single minute in the whole month. That can save you money and greatly reduce your attack surface. Okay, so now that we're experts, and I like to this long rant about containers and serverless, um, how, should we, how should we secure them? Well, one, don't stop doing all the regular apps like you should do. Don't forget because we're doing new tech. This will be the main advice for every single item. Don't forget all the things you already know. So for this, we would log and monitor. You still wanna know what's up, right? Oh, wait, 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 no. We want to still write secure code. We want to still validate our inputs. We still want to um, encrypt our data in transit and at rest. Like we still want to do all that stuff, but we also want to employ API gateways as a security buffer. We want to not only log and monitor the functions, but we should give that information to the SIM because your SOC needs to know what's going on. Um, we want to manage our secrets in a secret store. So secret store is like a password manager for computers. So computers talk to secret stores, humans talk to password managers. And the idea is you programmatically manage all your secrets so human beings never have them, which means less mistakes and less leaks. Um, we wanna deploy our functions with minimal granularity. And by that, I mean a serverless app should do one thing. If it needs to do 20 things, maybe you need 20 different serverless apps or 10 but don't have a serverless app that does literally everything. And you should have isolated perimeters. And by that, I mean, if you have a serverless app and it calls another serverless app, it should not trust each other. It should not use, you know, connect to the, you know, this one calls this one and it's like, oh, I'm sure it's fine. No, you still need to authenticate and authorize every single time. Next. Third-party component library management, also known, in my opinion, as software supply chain security. Right now, lots of apps have lots of code in it that you did not write. So your framework, um, a NuGet package, a cool JavaScript plugin, anything like a, th a thing that manages your images for you and compresses them and then removes the geo-tracking information in it. All of that is code you didn't write, but you're still accepting the risk. A lot of people will call this open source security. However, .NET framework is proprietary and I use it and I still care if it's secure or not. And like it's still humans, which sometimes make mistakes, creating it. And is it a kick-ass like framework? Yes. But are there bugs in older versions? Absolutely. And I want to know. And so it's not just open source. It doesn't matter all the components that you add need to be secure. And so 
I suggest using a software composition analysis tool. So SCA for short, there's a whole bunch on the market and I'm not going to name a whole bunch of names because this is not a marketing pitch. This is the lesson, yo. And also you could just search it and you'll find lots. Um, but the point is, is that you want it to check. Ideally, you would do two different checks. You wouldn't just do one, assuming you can afford it. But just doing one will be a huge, huge benefit to you. Also, you should scan your repository and you should scan in your build pipelines. The reason for this is one, you might have all this legacy stuff that you hardly ever build or that you don't put through a pipeline and you just like publish once in a blue moon. You still want to know if those components are secure. And then on top of that, having it in your pipeline could stop you from accidentally adding something that has big problems and it can break the build and block you before that ever gets out onto the internet. It's really important. Next, online storage. Online storage, so basically your data are the, is the crown jewels of where you work. So the most important thing of every single company is your employees. And the second most important thing is your data. And since we're not doing physical security, we're doing IT security, we're gonna talk about your data. Um, so I'm a firm believer that we should lock everything down by default. You should make it so you have to pry all of that security off with like a fork and a knife so that you could accidentally leak data. It's so important that you make the default the most secure way to do whatever you want. And creating a template for your org and then enforcing it with a policy with your cloud provider is really, really an ideal way to accomplish this. I believe that all of the clouds have a thing that will alert you if someone's breaking policy, i.e. peeling off the layers of security. Um, I know Azure does. I used to work for Microsoft. I don't work there anymore. But usually they all, all the major clouds have all the same features, which is kind of awesome. Another thing, which a lot of people, a lot of people will tell me like, oh, that's not very sexy. Yeah, yeah, classifying your data isn't like a really fun, exciting task. However, you know what's awesome when I'm in an incident and I find out that the data is, oh, totally unclassified, that's public knowledge. No problem. No need for me to grow a lot of new gray hairs, right? But if I'm in an incident and I find out, okay, so this information is actually secret inform government information. It should never have been there in the first place. Somehow it's been leaked. We need to respond appropriately. That helps me set expectations and also know exactly what parts of my incident response process that I should enact. Having classification of your data also means the computers can know how to treat it. It means the developers know how to treat it. We should be classifying our data. And I know it's not exciting, but sometimes we have to do boring stuff so we can do the cool stuff. I am a firm believer that humans shouldn't be accessing your online storage in your cloud. Identity, uh, or sorry, um, <laughs> like computers accounts, should, service accounts should be accessing it, not human accounts. So Tanya's account should not be acting on behalf of an app and then going into your online storage, that app should have its own service account and that should access it. And we should have monitoring of all of our online storage. So monitoring, file integrity monitoring, port sniffing, and we wanna have alerts. So for instance, if someone copies all the stuff out of your online storage, that should be an alert. And then let's say, then they go and they delete it, that should probably be a bigger alert. And then if they go to delete the backup, that should definitely trigger an incident and you should block them. Uh, yes, and I already discussed service accounts. So now let's talk about containers and orchestration. So we're already experts in containers from that blue slide three slides ago, right? So a container is a subset of a virtual machine. It's a subset of an operating system. It's just the parts that you need to run the thing that you're gonna do. And um, they're much, much smaller. You can have a whole bunch of them all on the same server, many, many, many. And if you want to manage all of them as a whole, you would do orchestration. So Kubernetes is the biggest product and basically the thing it seems to be the standard and dominating the industry and that's why I'm naming them. But basically the idea is that if you wanna start 
stop, destroy, edit, like all the things you would do to manage all of your containers, you would do it via orchestration. Think of an orchestra and the director directing everything, that would be your orchestration system. And then all of the musicians in the orchestra would be your containers. That really helps me personally visualize it. Okay, so don't forget yourself. You should still design your containers and everything else the same way you would if you were doing a regular virtual machine. You would still harden it, right? You would still apply zero trust. You do all the things that you already know that you should do, right? So don't treat them, don't, don't let them off the hook. But there's more, so there's slightly more. So there's new types of configurations you're gonna have to learn. And there's new tools for scanning containers versus virtual machines. So you're gonna have to learn those too. There's new types of vulnerabilities to watch out for. Just like people wanna escape virtual machines, they wanna escape containers. You need to watch out for that. This is the one that's like specifically new. You really need to make sure that you're very careful about who is able to edit or create containers. That is kind of like the keys to your kingdom. You definitely wanna have multi-factor authentication on those you wanna monitor and have a short list of who gets to do that. That is a very, very important thing. And basically do all the same thing you used to do, scan, you know, harden your configurations, either patch or replace with updated versions. Like make sure that you are applying all of the updates. And by applying, I mean like getting a new version of that thing. Also don't just fish random containers off of Docker Hub. Um, just like because it's on Docker Hub doesn't mean that's necessarily super secure. You should definitely make sure if you're the security team that you are providing a place where either there are approved containers or containers that you've tested or templates that you've created for your dev team and your ops team. You should not be allowing them to just go off and be like wild crazy shopping trip on Docker Hub because although there's lots of cool things out there, you just don't do that. Okay, next, APIs and microservices. So an API is a web app with no front end. That's it. It has all the back end stuff. It just has no front end. So you can talk to it from a front end. You can talk to it from a mobile app. If you're a hacker, you can talk to it from wherever you want. Like you could get an app like Postman and then you could just call APIs and talk to them if they're not protected properly. I know, I've done it, but with permission. Um, and then microservices are APIs that are itty bitty, teeny tiny, that just do one thing. So let's say, um, you know, it's a, a delivery site and they wanna look up your address. So they ask for your postal code. You put in the postal code, it goes to the microservice, it comes back with the rest of the address for you. Boom, microservice. So API is no front end. You still need to do all the same stuff. <laughs> So you still need to do input validation. You still need to authorize people to use your app. Um, although there's no front end, so you don't need to do output encoding, you still need to do all the other things that don't involve the front end. And it's really, really, really important that you don't forget yourself. I call it forgetting yourself because that's what it feels like to me. Um, so all the regular AppSec stuff still needs to happen. But on top of that, Service Mesh. Service Mesh is a cool new thing that a bunch of smart people made. Um, all the clouds have their own, which are proprietary just for their cloud. And then there's a bunch that are actually, um, what's the word, uh, that are agnostic and can be used on any cloud. And the idea is it's an infrastructure layer that overlays all your APIs and microservices and it, you don't have to change your code and it just encrypts everything and manages things and secures them as they're happening. So it will not fix your code for you, but it will protect your service. Another thing is creating a standardized template. I have worked at places and done testing where everyone's making their own <laughs> APIs and having them be called different ways. And that makes it really hard to test. And that makes it really hard to make sure that people are doing the right thing. So there should be standardizations and whenever possible templating. And then you can make sure the template is secure. And then if everyone builds off of that, you start from a more secure place. Um, I'm a big fan of linting. So linting is basically, it is the grammar police for your code. So no poetic license. Um, I know like lots of programming languages, for instance, you don't have to declare the variable type. It'll just guess, not with linting. 
we don't want to leave anything up to chance. We want to be explicit with everything and setting the grammar police. And by that, I mean linting on your code. You'll have higher quality code that will be more secure. Um, we should also do throttling and resource quotas. So throttling is slowing things down as people ask for more. And resource quotas means you hit a number and you just stop. So let's say someone's trying to log in and a human being will like definitely screw up their password two, three, four, even five times in a row. But they can't answer it 10 times in one second. That is a machine. But they can answer it 10 times in a minute. So you need to throttle and slow that down for each consecutive one. So after the first five, maybe make it wait like one second or a half second, and then slow, 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 slow. And then a human being, of course, isn't, <laughs> there's no human being that I know that is so stubborn that would try to log in 100 times in an hour. And so you should cut them off probably cut them off before that because it's an automated machine accessing your stuff. So if you pair throttling and quotas together, you will have better results and you have to be careful. I know because you don't want to lock out real customers. You need to authenticate and then authorize. We need to know who we are talking to and then tell them what they're allowed to go do in our systems. Um, this goes for everything that went for everything. And this goes for everything. Don't give verbose error messages. If someone gives you a malformed request to call your API, don't tell them what they did wrong. Because me as a pen tester, I'm like, great, thanks for helping me craft a better attack. Just say malformed request, that's it. Computers aren't making typos, right? So if there's a malformed request, there's a reason for it. Um, and the last one on this is, and again, this applies to all web apps. If there are HTTP methods or verbs, as they're sometimes called, that you're not using, block all of them. Block all of them. So if you're using trace but not head, block head. Most people use get and post for everything. But if you're not using delete, block it. Especially always block FTP. Okay, next, modern tooling. So I'm gonna tell you about the different types of modern tools that exist, just the types of tools, not the vendors. So I asked, interactive application security testing. So it's a little bit like DAST because your app is running and it's moving dynamically. However, interactive application security testing tests as you're using the app. So it only tests the parts of the app that are actually called, which is pretty interesting. Um, it's supposed to save time and be fast. RASP, so this should say, F typo. So this should say runtime application security testing, not real time, although it does work very quickly. Um, and this is as a next generation WAF or web app firewall. The idea of a RASP is that um, it's like a stub within your application and then it is more specific for each one of your inputs as opposed to a WAF, a first generation web application firewall, where it just has a giant amount of regular expressions and every single request to your app has to go through that. A RASP is more specific and broken down into smaller pieces. There's also usually, AI and ML, which are obviously amazing marketing buzzwords, but um, having machine learning as part of your, your protection is probably awesome. I've, I've seen and heard good things. Um, file integrity monitoring is always paired with application waitlisting for best results. So file integrity monitoring is making sure that none of your system files get renamed or changed. And application waitlisting means only things that are on this waitlist, this approved list, are allowed to run. And so when malware tries to get onto your servers, the first thing it does is it tries to boot up and then the, it'll look at the accepted list and it'll be like, you're not on there. No. And it won't be allowed to start. So then the second thing malware does, it's like, I know what I'll do. I'll rename myself to a system file and overwrite it. Then I can run. And eh, file integrity monitoring won't allow that. So Although it is a lot of work to implement this properly, it's just such a huge win <laughs> because malware is just stopped in its tracks. Um, cloud native controls. So these are security tools built specifically for the cloud. So some of them are like um, cloud specific or provider or vendor specific, and some of them are agnostic and work across many different clouds. And you should totally check them out. 
if you are paying for cloud services, there's probably a whole bunch of free security tools that they're providing and you should use them because you're paying for them. And also they're probably pretty good uh, because otherwise the cloud providers wouldn't, wouldn't have them. Um, adding security tools to your DevOps pipeline. So I, I wanted to word this differently. So these are AppSec tools that have been changed or developed specifically to run in pipelines. So um, a lot of the older tools that are standards that are really amazing don't run well in pipelines. So either they need to be adjusted or there's all sorts of really cool, exciting new tools coming out, some of which I can't tell you about because I'm talking to all these startups and they're telling me they're amazing ideas. Um, but yeah, tool, there's like all these cool tools coming out that are made right for pipelines. Um, if you're using the cloud, you can make customized alerts and you can automate responses. So if you see something a lot, you can create an automated response, which is really cool. And I don't know what to call it except application inventory tools. For those that follow me last year, I started a company that did inventory. Like we made a tool that did that and our company didn't work out and that's fine. But there's all these other companies that like did not fall apart. <laughs> They're creating really cool tools that can help you find all of your apps or all of your public facing assets, which is so important because you have so much stuff on the internet that you don't know about, but they can still be attacked. And understanding your complete attack surface is so, so important. Now for tactics, modern tactics. So adding tools to your pipeline and not just doing them outside your pipeline is a new tactic. Um, taking unit tests, duplicating them, and then adding malicious payloads and making sure that your application fails gracefully. This is a new tactic I've seen, which is really cool. Um, breaking your security activities into smaller pieces. So like doing a security sprint, for instance. Um, taking your penetration test results and then turning them into unit tests to make sure that those problems don't happen again. And also, you know, creating unit tests if appropriate and having them in your other apps. Because if they find something really interesting in your pen test, those programmers probably made more than one app for you and they made a, may have made that same mistake elsewhere. Um, tuning tools for automation and efficiency. I don't mean that so condescending, but tools are way more flexible than they used to be and this is really cool and spending the time to you know suppress false positives etc so that they work even better and better is definitely worth your time um automated repository scanning is your code is just sitting there so why not just have scans run on it all the time right if you already buy a tool you should do it um so the next thing is devsecops this is my favorite topic um this is the idea of performing AppSec in a DevOps environment. Um, it includes, but is not limited to, adding security tooling to your pipeline, um, ensuring a very fast feedback about security. So fixing bugs earlier, pushing left, making every single moment a teaching moment, even the ones where we have egg on our face, which is hard for me personally, um, but there's so much value in it. And it's just us weaving security throughout their processes and making sure what we're doing is efficient. Oh, and there's like a link at the bottom to a talk I did about this because I have like several talks on this topic. Um, so cloud security. Tanya, you can't just talk about cloud security in every talk. That's not allowed. Um, but some apps live in the cloud and I truly believe that if you, if you are an application security professional and you work in a company that is using cloud, that you need to learn some cloud security. Because if you make a super secure app and someone still hacks the crap out of it, it still has a, a, a giant data breach, there's still egg all over your face. And I think that if your company is gonna move to the cloud, you need to learn some cloud security. Um, I have lots of other information about that, so we'll just leave that for now. But the stress is that I feel like you need to even if you're not cloud security expert. Okay, so here are modern app, here, here are the things that the purple team does actually. We'll put it like that. Okay, so now let's talk about automating boring stuff and then continuous learning. So I learned to code so I wouldn't have to do things more than twice. <laughs> 
And the reason why we automate is to avoid something called toil. So my, my friend Steve Morowski made this slide and is the best. He's awesome. If you want to learn about site reliability engineering, you should follow Steve. So anything that are these things are things that we can automate. See that? That's Atlas pushing the builder. We don't want to do that. If we want to keep our employees happy and keep them working for us, if there's boring crap they do, we need to stop it. So automation. So this can be adding stuff to your pipeline. It can be meaning a security, an asynchronous security pipeline that kicks off once a week with automated tools in it. It can mean doing infrastructure as code and then security as code. It can mean um, automating things for the devs, right? Basically, you want to focus on proactive instead of reactive work so that we can prevent security incidents from happening in the first place, so that we can upgrade our, our defenses, so that we spend less time cleaning up messes, right? So that is the purpose of automation, less toil, more triumph. And then continuous learning, what you're doing right now. Um, so the moment we stop learning, <laughs> then we fall behind. We can give lunch and learns, we can offer computer-based training. I realize that I work for a training company, so I seem really biased, but I can't tell you how important it is that we keep learning because our dev people and our ops people are just gonna keep bringing in new tools and keep doing cool new stuff, and either we keep up or we don't. Um, you can create like a learning calendar in your block, like a block in your calendar every single week for learning. Um, you could do job shadowing, mentoring, on-the-job training. There's so many options. Like if you find something really big, share the information with every team. Um, I'm a huge fan of gathering metrics on your AppSec programs um, and then designing all of your lessons around that. So for instance, finding your top three vulnerabilities and then creating lunch and learns on those and then hopefully seeing the instances of those go way down build your own specific training for each specific team. You probably hope the sysadmins know slightly different things than the help desk team, but it's really important you talk to them. Um, and so I'm gonna briefly tell you the time I invited, I invented DevOps, <laughs> which I didn't invent. Someone, so I spoke at RSA the past couple of years and I gave a talk about DevSecOps and one of my friends went back to work in another city and she told me this person from her office had had not been in training so long, they saw my talk and thought that I had invented DevOps. Yeah. And although like that made me feel really cool, that's not true and I never said it in the talk. And can you imagine being so out to lunch that you've never even heard of DevOps before? Can you imagine that? So don't be that person. In summary, uh, I'm not so cool as to have built DevOps, but I really love it. <laughs> okay, so conclusion. I don't want us to think of this guy when we think of hackers. This is my friend Steph, and this is what a hacker looks like. This is what a hacker looks like. Look in the mirror, that's what a hacker looks like. We need to change our perception of our industry if we want everyone to come and work here, and we need them. We need more people. And I'm hoping that as we continue as an industry, we can shed this angry young man hoodie basement sitting in the dark thing that we have going and instead see people like Steph and think she looks like a hacker. Um, Cause we can't do it unless everyone helps because right now we're failing. And the last part of my rant is please be nice to developers and all of IT. They are our friends and we can't do this without them. <laughs> please don't be mean to software developers because it makes them not want to do security. <laughs> Okay, so that's the end of that rant. Now some free resources in my two minutes or one minute that are left. So first of all, join the Many Hats Club. And after you've joined the Many Hats Club, join OWASP. I love OWASP. I don't like them. I love our community. It's so wonderful. If you're a woman or a person who identifies as a woman, please join WOSEC. Make kick-ass female friends. Uh, we welcome you. We're in 32 cities around the world and we're having fun online events. We're having a capture the flag for all levels and it's free, of course, like all of our stuff. WOSEC's free. Everything's free. We just want to meet you. Um, this should say Cyber Mentoring Monday. Ah, so it's every Monday, Cyber Mentoring Monday, please consider asking someone a question or 
answering a question, reaching out and suggesting a book or a video or having a virtual copy with someone, you don't understand how much that means to someone who's scared and intimidated and puts themselves out there and asks for help. When you come answer them, it's so much more meaningful than you realize. And last resource, me. I blog and I tweet and I video and I do all of the things. So please check out my stuff. And with that, as a summary of what we've learned today, Purple Team is collaboration. And we also learned lots of modern tools and practices for the win. We have to adjust if we want to keep up. And we definitely want to keep up. Thank you for your time and attention today. At the top of my slide there are a link to the slides. I promise I won't hack you with it. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Tanya Jenga. Tanya. Seriously, that was amazing. That was like a, a like a knowledge jump of like mm -hmm. epic proportions. Thank you ever so much for doing that. And uh, will this be recorded? But also, um, what we'll do is we'll I'll, I'll get a copy of that and uh, I'll post it on social as well and post it on Discord. So, thank you very much. Uh, are we are we now not live? <laughs>